you know, and to mind the gap. It means watch your step. <laughs> so that's what that means. But anyhow, I noticed this guy over here, he was reading um, the Da Vinci Code book by, uh, by Dan Brown. And I, I had read it because I try to stay up on those things. Basically, the thesis of the Da Vinci Code is that the early Catholics are the ones who put the Bible together. And since everybody knows the Catholic Church is corrupt, the process of selecting the books for the New Testament was a corrupt process. And so the books that we have in there aren't supposed to be there, and the ones that we don't have are supposed to be there. See, that's the basic thesis of, of the Da Vinci Code book. And uh, so he was reading that. And I asked him, I said, uh, you enjoying the read? And he said, yeah. Well, about that time, the, the subway stopped, so we got off. He happened to be getting off at the same stop that I did, so I continued the conversation. I said, well, actually, what this is all about is, is absolutes. And he said, what do you mean by that? And I said, well, Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life, and nobody comes to the Father except through me. He says, does that mean Jews too? And I said, yep. <laughs> he split so fast. See, because in, in, in Western Europe, you can't say anything about Jews. I mean, it's, you know, it's, I mean, uh, you know, you say anything bad about anti-Semitic, boy, that's because of the Holocaust and all that sort of stuff. Except now with the, the Lord Mayor of London being a Muslim, <laughs> so, uh, I suspect that, that those things are shifting. But uh, see, it's a narrow, it's a narrow line. You know, I read some quotes from a guy named Frederick C. Grant. Frederick C. Grant was a longtime professor of ethics at uh, Union Theological Seminary. Now, Union Theological Seminary is the Methodist seminary in the New York City area. It trains communists. It trains all the Methodist ministers to be communists, right? And uh, in, I'll pause that story. I had a contact in Helen. I was, before Mr. Goal came to Helen, I had, some things going here. I uh, turned it over to a guy named David Carnes, and that didn't work. But uh, so, I was, well, one night I had I had a contact from Libby that had moved to Townsend. So I I stopped in at Townsend and went over and beat on their door, and uh, walked in and and then uh, there was one of the guys I knew from college by the name of Ken Miller there. And I said, hey, Ken, how you doing? I said, good. He said, well, I, he said, I'm the Methodist minister in town. I said, oh, really? That's interesting. You know, from good old 11th floor, head to south, you know. And uh, so we got to talk a little bit. And I said, well, you know, I mean, I started quoting scripture. And, and finally he got upset. He said, what you have there in the Bible, you have a paper pope. Don't you think that the general experience of the church counts for anything? See? see, but that's what they're feeding these guys, see? So Frederick C. Grant was a professor at ethics at, uh, at uh, Union, the I always call it Union Theological Cemetery. Uh, and he, he wrote a book called The Apostle of Discord. And in that book, he said the uh, early church was anti-Semitic. Uh, caught the disease of anti-Semitism, and fortunately the scriptures got infected with the same virus. See, because it was Jews that killed Jesus, right? It's Jews who used godless men to put, put Christ to death, right? All those anti-Semitic remarks. So what we got to do is pull the anti-Semitic remarks out of the New Testament. That's, that's where these guys go. That's why there's a problem here. I am the way and the truth and the life. Nobody, but nobody coming to the Father except through me. That's it. Doesn't matter how many dreams you have. Doesn't matter, you know, somebody woke you up in the middle of the night and told you you're okay. Doesn't matter. See, you're coming to God through Jesus Christ. Jesus said, if you'd have known me, you would have known the Father also, and from now on you know him and have seen him, Jesus to the apostles. That's interesting. <laughs> Jesus is saying, you're looking at me, you're really looking at the Father. And there's things all the way through the gospel according to John. You know, Remember the time that uh, 
he's arguing with uh, some of those hot meetings with the, uh, the Jewish hierarchy. Well, Jesus said, uh, look, if anybody keeps my word, he'll never taste death. That's a pretty big statement. And they said, look, we, we know you're crazy, man. We know you're demented. Um, Abraham died and the, and the prophets died. And you say, if anybody keeps my word, you'll never see death. You're not great in our father Abraham, are you? And Jesus came back and he said, you know, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he's talking about when three men showed up to have a lunch with Abraham and Sarah. And uh, the Lord promised that uh, Sarah, uh, Sarah within a year would have a son. That was a really happy day. In fact, it was so happy that when the child was born, they named him Isaac, which means he laughs. So <laughs> Jesus said, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it, and he was glad. See, and the Jews picked up what he said. They're not. You said you're not even fifty years old. You've seen Abraham. Right? They're 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 catching the drift. And he fires back and says, "Before Abraham was born, I am." That's who's standing there. I am. If you know me, you know the Father also, right? Now, and you you know him. You've seen him. Okay, and you're going to see more of him. As the revelation continues. So Jesus then, we talked about this a couple weeks ago, but I want to come back and work on it a little bit. You know, I mean, I have a what I call a hubcap style of teaching, which means you just keep beating on it until it pops in. Okay. <laughs> yeah. You know, well, sometimes necessary, right? So Jesus, then, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Firstborn of all creation doesn't mean he's the first thing that Jehovah created, like the Jehovah's Witnesses teach, right? The firstborn of all creation means he's the one that owns it all. Okay? Possessor, right? No one has seen God at any time, then. The only begotten God is who's in the bosom of the Father. He has explained him. See, so the purpose of the scriptures is to explain God through Jesus Christ. The idea being, if you know Jesus, you'll know God. That, that makes it simple. So, you'll, if you know Jesus, you'll know the Holy Spirit too. <laughs> the glorified Christ, scripture says, that is the radiance of the Father's glory and therein he's the exact representation of God. <clears throat> the, uh, I like to illustrate it this way. When uh, the baby was there in the arms of the Madonna uh, in the house when the wise men showed up, the, uh, that was accurate, but incomplete. When you got Jesus at the age of 12, uh, uh, give him some good answers and ask him some uh, tough questions of the learned scholars in the temple at the age of 12. That's more information. It's accurate, but it's incomplete. When you uh, show up at, uh, at Jesus' immersion and you see the heavens open and the Holy Spirit descending of the dove and the voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son whom I am well pleased, that's more information. It's accurate, but it's incomplete. You get to walk by with Jesus by the side of the Sea of Galilee and sit down and listen to him teach the crowds and the parables. That's more information. It's accurate, but it's incomplete. You go with him through the kangaroo trials, kangaroo courts, and see how he handles it. That's more information. It's accurate, but it's incomplete. Uh, you watch him be scourged and, and, and mistreated, crown of thorns platted on his head. That's uh, more information. It's accurate, but it's incomplete. You even watch the crucifixion. And that's accurate. It's incomplete. Watch him take him down off the cross and lay him in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. So there's the body. That's more information. It's accurate, but it's incomplete. You get to go with Mary Magdalene and, and uh, you know, and get to stand next to the empty tomb and have that conversation with Jesus. She figures out it's Jesus when she says, he says to her, Mary. Uh, she says, Rabboni, you're back. Okay. 
Uh, that's more information, and it's accurate, but it's incomplete. Forty days Jesus appeared to the apostles in various situations, all accurate but incomplete. From the fortieth day, uh, Jesus led them to the Mount of Olives east of Jerusalem. In their presence, he shot up like that, and the cloud received him out of his sight. On the underside of the cloud, he still got the the uh, the nail scars. He still got the spear wound. But on the other side of that cloud, boom! The radiance of the Father's glory. Infinitely bright and infinite in extent. Now that's hard to wrap your brain around, okay? But that's why, see, the, the, the purveyors of, of a false gospel who want to manipulate people emotionally, they're not going to go there. They're going to take it to the cross. You know, and they're going to tell you tear jerking stories about, you know, people's blood being shed and Jesus' blood being shed. And if they can get the audience crying, you know, they, they got them. You know? And uh, because, but how, how are you going to get anybody emotional about an infinitely bright light, infinite extent? When I first did the new creation book, some of you guys uh, remember fondly uh, Pascal Redfern. <laughs> and uh, so Pascal had uh, just moved to Missoula at the time, and he was on his way to something called the, the uh, you know, North American Christian Convention in St. Louis. And so he stopped at my place there in Bozeman, and I said, hey, uh, Pascal, here's this book I just published. It Here it's called The New Creation. Read it. Tell me what you think. So on the way back, he stopped in, and uh, I said, did you, uh, did you get a chance to read it, Pascal? He said, yeah. So what do you think? He said, well, it's good material, but he said you could never preach it. So why couldn't you ever preach it? He says, no congregation would, would sit still for it. No congregation, yeah. Now, I, th I think he had a pretty good handle on Christian churches, and I think he was right for the audiences that he's familiar with, right? Because, you know, you have to do, you have to lay a lot of groundwork and you have to do it right and, you know, step by step, take a person along. See, but, but now it's, it's not, you know, we're trying to move you by emotion. It's that we're trying to communicate information that we can process and then make decisions about. That's, that's what we're trying to do here. So he's the, the radiance of the Father's glory. And then that's the exact representation of God. That's what it is. See, to know Jesus in glory is to know God. In uh, 1 John chapter 1, verse 5, it says, um, hard, hard to think and quote. It's, okay, turn to 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. <clears throat> First John 1 John 1.5 said, uh, This is the message we have heard from him, announced to you that God's light, and in him there's no darkness at all. So I'm going to play that back on slow speed. I'm going to put a couple dot, dot, dots in there, and I'm going to put some emphasis on it, okay? This is the message. God is light. It says, isn't it? This is the message. God is light. This is how this is revealed to us by Jesus going through these steps to ascend to glory and have that information revealed to the apostles. Okay. Pause here. Any questions or any comments by anybody? Okay. So the only way to have God explained to know God is to know Jesus in glory. The end of that particular slideshow. Okay? But, don't go away. So the title of this one is Seeing Jesus in Glory. 
Okay. And again, it ties in with something we did a couple of weeks ago, but this is really important stuff. I mean, to behold the king and his beauty. See, that's that's what God's trying to do. He's trying to get us to the point where we desire the same spiritual things that he desires. And you know, for example, I you know, I did that Grand Canyon trip. And uh, I think I mentioned that on the second day, the camera that I took, I had a nice Pendaflex camera that I bought so I could take really good pictures. And uh, the battery went bad. And I thought, well, no problem. I'll just, you know, retrieve this uh, uh, other battery that I got from Matt Wilson. Well, that battery was dead. Okay, so from that point on, I had to use my, my, my iPhone camera, which takes great pictures. But I didn't have any, you know, I didn't have any charging battery pack or anything like that. So, man, I was, I mean, I'd pull it out, I'd turn it on, I'd take the picture, I'd turn it on, <laughs> stick it back away. Because I, because I wanted to be able to contact Katie when I got out of that canyon, okay? Now, that didn't happen because there was no cell coverage, even outside, you know, when the helicopter is out there, still no cell coverage. So there was no cell coverage until I landed at the airport in, in Boulder, Boulder City, Nevada, okay? And so the first thing I wanted to do is I wanted to see Katie. Actually, I had to go to the bathroom first. <laughs> but but I, I really wanted to see Katie. And, uh, you know, why would I want to see Katie? You know, and I could tell she wanted to see me too. See, so if I... I can use that to understand, okay, do I want to see God? See, do I want to see God with the same intensity? See, this is where he's going with us, is to help us to, to process that. So seeing, see, the goal is to what? Desire to see Jesus in glory. In the, Remember in the case of Moses where, you know, God told Moses, you can ask for anything you want. And Moses says, I want to see your glory. And God says, nobody can see my face and live. What that tells you is that the face of God is the same as the glory of God. And so one of the things you can tell from the scriptures, one of the things you're doing is you're seeking God's face. In the Old Testament, that's all they could do was seek it. We can drop the K off of that and see it. We are a very blessed, privileged people if we can just process it. So what has to happen is the fleshly barrier that's re has got to be removed, okay? Uh, the earnest desire then of the Father in heaven, sons might be regenerated and behold the king and his beauty. The problem is that no one who's still in the flesh can see the glory of God. See, as long as the flesh is there, you know, the... Uh, Scripture, I mean, there's a sense in which the physical body is flesh. Paul said, in my flesh, you know, I, I do my best to, to walk in the footsteps of Christ, so to speak. I live by faith. But generally in the Scripture, flesh is a spiritual entity. It's, uh, it's kind of based on the idea beginning with the fleshly body, but it's not, not the fleshly body. And so... In, for example, Romans 6, he's going to call it the body of sin. Colossians 2, is going to call it the body of flesh or the body of sins of the flesh. And in 2 Corinthians 3, it's going to call it the veil. So I, I just kind of pull all that together and, and call it the spiritual sheath that drops in there. So when a person commits their first sin, you know, 16, 17, 18, whatever that is, and they commit their first sin, boom, that spiritual sheath drops in there. And now their fellowship with God's cut off. See, until a person is old enough to commit that first sin, the Bible says that the angels of these little ones continually behold the face of my Father who is in heaven. They're in fellowship. See, once that spiritual sheath drops in there, boom, it's cut. Okay? And there's no human effort that's, uh, that's going to get rid of that. You know, you can't bring in enough bulldozers or anything else to move that out of there. So that, that can only be done by God. And God's trying to communicate to the human race and said, look, it, you guys got problems. 
you know you got problems, okay? You're, you're running around with your heads hanging down, and you're discouraged. I caught the weather channel this morning because I always want to know what the weather's like in Helena and, uh, and Butte and Great Falls and Billings and Missoula because <laughs> that might be important. And uh, so they were running a special segment on uh, <clears throat> the uh, tremendous amount of loneliness that's out there. And they try to attribute it to COVID and, and uh, you know, social media and, and, you know, whatever. You know, of course, it actually starts with the fact that people are separated from God, but the Weather Channel not going to say that. And, of course, you'd be excited to know that the federal government is now going to call that a health issue, and the federal government is going to come jump in and jump in and help fix that. <laughs> Anything the federal government gets involved in, doesn't fix it, okay? But see, it, it, it is uh, honestly a real problem. And you, we live in an age of increasing isolation. Um, you know, you don't have to go to the store anymore. Just, you know, sit in front of your TV screen and, you know, look it up on Amazon or some online supplier. And a couple of days later, be at your, your door. You know, you have, a lot of people work from home. You know, a lot of, you know, you can climb in your car, not even have to know your neighbors, <clears throat> drive to, you know, your work inside a, you know, kind of a gated community type of thing or something. You don't have to interact with anybody. And a lot of people like that. Kind of reminds me of, you know, one of the country songs I heard. Uh, you know, the guy was, you know, he's about five foot two, just a little overweight. And, uh, you know, but when he got home and went downstairs and fired up his Mac, he turned out to be about six foot six and he wouldn't really his, his sick pack, you know. And he says, I'm a whole lot cooler online. <laughs> well, there's a lot of that, isn't there? A lot of that. It's the same. You know, a, a staggering statistic to me is seven million men of working age never came back to work after COVID. Seven million. See, that's why you got help wanted signs up everywhere. See, Seven million. See, what are they doing? Sixty percent of young men of marriageable age says they're not interested in marriage. Sixty percent. Okay. So what do the girls do? Lesbians. That's what's happening. Well, the real problem is back here, isn't it? The real problem is that that sin barrier that's dropped in there. And, you know, a person becomes a slave of sin. They also become captive by Satan. And so Satan is just wreaking havoc here in the midst of the human race. No one who is in the flesh can see the glory of God. That fleshly barrier has to be removed. And so, in, for example, Colossians 2, 11 and 12 there's a spiritual circumcision that takes place in immersion. We've talked about that. You know, the physical circumcision that was implemented in Abraham's day was designed to set the stage for this. See? And, and God told Abraham, look at any of your males that are not circumcised, they're cut off from fellowship with me, period, in the Old Testament sense. Anybody that's not spiritually circumcised had no fellowship with God whatsoever. But like the, in the physical one, the baby's boy's foreskin was slit, cut off, and removed in immersion. That body of flesh is slit, cut off, and removed. Same, same exact picture. Tremendous. <clears throat> Moses used to put a veil. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago over his face so that the sons of Israel might not look intently while it's fading away. See, in the same way he said a veil lies over the heart of the unbeliever and obstructs his very spiritual view of Christ on the throne. See, and we're just we're trying to help people. We're honestly trying to help people get to where they really would like to go. If the devil's got all those holes, black holes painted on the fence, and people run up to those and they they hit them, you know, and their nose hurts, and and uh, they're tired of religion. See. And, you know, but that's that, that confusion is, is Satan's goal to try to keep it as absolutely as confused as possible. 
Whenever a man turns to the Lord, Paul said in 2 Corinthians 3.16, the veil is taken away. <clears throat> See, and I do want to mention this, that in Acts 2.38, kind of a review point, Peter said, and the apostles said, repent, right? In Acts 3.19, Peter and John said, repent. In Acts 2.38, says, be immersed in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Okay, so be immersed in the name of Jesus Christ. Acts 3.19 says, turn, return, turn again. Acts 2.38 says, for forgiveness of sins. Acts 3.19 says, your sins will be blotted out. Acts 2.38 says, you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Acts 3.19 says, the times of refreshing will come from the presence of the Lord. But the point is, is where immersion is in Acts 2.38, turning is in Acts 3.19 and other scriptures. So when the scripture talks about turning to the Lord, that takes place in immersion. Now, conversion is the old word for turning, okay? So you speak of somebody being converted, that means they turned, okay? So that's why a number of years ago, I had Brad Smith to, you know, do some bumper stickers for me, but they said, conversion in immersion, See, because that's, that's when it happens, okay? You know, it's none of this, you know, oh, I turned to the Lord, you know, I knelt down on a park bench in Seattle, and uh, in, in the middle of a rainstorm and end of my rope and I prayed and I turned to the Lord. No, he didn't. You, know, you had a nice figment of your imagination. Okay. The veil is removed in Christ, he also says. Well, when do you get into Christ? Well, you're immersed into Christ, right? Same point. Veil's removed, okay? And so both turning and, and in Christ refer to immersion into Christ. So then we as Christians then with this unveiled face behold as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. So our inner man, like we talked about, actually sees that glory because the sin barrier has been removed. And I do want to stress we wouldn't know a thing about that except that the scripture tells us. You know, there's no, there's no personal experience you can have that's going to tell you anything about that. See, God puts it in written form and leaves it in written form so that there cannot be any confusion about this. I mean, I don't know how many people I've talked to over the years and Jesus came to them in the middle of the night or whatever. No, he doesn't. No, that's why it's written. It's written. You can go back and check it. You can read it. And you know, you can tell really quick whether somebody's blowing smoke, and they always are. Written. So what we know about the spiritual realm is in the scriptures. No other place. No other place. You know, Elizabeth Clare Prophet, operating for a while out of south of Livingston there, <clears throat> she claimed that uh, between, but by, when Jesus was uh, between 18 and 30, he went to Tibet. And he studied under the Buddhist monks at Tibet and, and came back in the admixture of Buddhism and Judaism as Christianity. And uh, see, she claimed to be in touch with the Ascended Masters before she went nuts. Um, that's what happens when you get into that realm. Uh, before she went nuts, uh, she was in contact with St. Germain, you know, the, the Ascended Master. Um, pretty interesting you know, how that works. See, the, the, the People can claim anything. And, you know, Satan will help them. Satan will help them along with that. She's, I, I remember, I was listening, I, you know, I'm, I was trying to convert uh, some of these guys. And so I agreed to listen to Elizabeth Clare Prophet speech, okay? And so, of course, I got to listen to some music, okay? So it's, you know, so I fast forwarded about 20 minutes. It was the same song, moving that thing along. It's really interesting because in one verse they talk about the Lord Jesus, and the next verse they talk about the Lord Shiva. So we had a couple of girls in the Christian school, and their mom was this uh, uh, cut thing, Church Universal and Triumphant. And so I remember I went one January, I went over to take the report cards over and 
you know, meet with mom, and I refused the carrot juice, thank you. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, I mean, you like some carrot juice? No, thank you. <laughs> and, uh, so I, so I'm talking to her, and all of a sudden, a car pulls up. I could hear the snow crunch outside, and, and, uh, a lady named Dixie walks in. Now, Dixie has porcelain fingernails porcelain fingernails and she has a diamond in that one and a diamond in that one okay now i you know usually you know i'm kind of an open guy you know i can kind of try there's an instant clash there and i i couldn't figure it out so so i walked out you know finished up my business there is a green volkswagen beetle there with a personalized plate said shiva Jesus said, everyone who is born of the spirits like the wind. The wind blows where it wishes. You hear the sound of it. Do not know where it goes or where it's coming from. See, but there's a pressure there. See, when, when we're indwelt by the spirit and we hit somebody like that, boom, there is, there's something there. Because okay. we are spirit beings. See? Uh, great conflict over this stuff. They, they, they claim all this information. They, they, they claim that they got it. Jesus said, nobody ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. If I told you earthly things you don't believe, how are you going to believe if I tell you heavenly things? we got to get the information from the book. Any thoughts or comments here on any of this? So the Apostle Paul prayed that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, out of Ephesians 1.18. See, there are such things we might call them spiritual eyes. And, but those eyes have to be guided by Scripture. Uh, I preached a, in the First Christian Church in Santa Rosa, California, same church that uh, Charles Schultz attended before he passed on to his reward. And I decided that day I was going to preach a proof that the Bible is the Word of God message. I figured that would be appropriate for the congregation. And so I titled my message, just as if the voice of God thundered. So I kind of did my proof of the Bible's Word of God. My point being that what is written in those pages is just the same power as if the voice of God thundering it right at you. Every word of it. Okay? When I got done, you know, and everything kind of quieted down, the preacher came over and he said, you really believe that, don't you? <laughs> I do. <laughs> he didn't. Okay? But this, the scripture is going to reveal these things to our spiritual eyes. Non-Christians are darkened in their understanding. They can't see Jesus, see Jesus with spiritual eyes or know him. Can't do it. I don't care how much they get behind one of those big microphones. Praise Jesus. Isn't it great to know the Lord tonight? They don't know anything, and the Lord doesn't know them. The lost, boy, this is a powerful verse, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that's in them and because of the hardness of their heart. I was invited to preach at the uh, Northman. It's a kind of a group of guys that used to meet in the upper part of the lower peninsula, Michigan. Steve Doty, Doty used to go there. And... Uh, so I was invited to preach a message on salvation. And uh, so uh, Mike Steer, we had him at Montana Family Camp one year. Uh, Mike Steer was kind of in charge of that. I kind of wandered over the campfire where he was, and his grandson was sitting there, uh, one of his daughters. And he said, so are you going to preach us a five-finger message tonight? I said, well, at least be one. <laughs> but... Uh, I, I, when I'm getting near the end of the message, I'm pointing out that, look, there is only one way of salvation, and that includes the immersion in Jesus' name. And I said, anybody that doesn't believe that or have practiced that, and then I did this. They're lost! You know, 600 guys out there, you know, and maybe they didn't get the point. They <laughs> yelled it again, right? And... Uh, so I got done, you know, and kind of wandering around some of the campfires. That was a pretty rough message. 
Why, why is that a rough message? Until we are willing to process what hell's like and heaven like and the gap between them and the fact that every person on this planet is either going to one or the other, see, then we're not going to be able to really process the, the commitment that the scripture wants us to have to truth. See, Jesus said, you're going to know the truth and the truth is going to make you free. See, until people are willing to process the fact that all their relatives that haven't been immersed into Christ are lost. See, until they're willing to process that, they're never free. They're never free. The, um, <clears throat> there's a young lady from Great Falls. She ended up being a college student there. And uh, about the same time Barb was there, and same year actually. And uh, so I ended up having a study with her in the, the, the girls' dorm. And uh, so I'm going through studies, and I look over, and there's this pool of water. There's a linoleum floor on concrete, okay? And I look over, there's a pool of water. And I said, well, it can't be any pipes that busted in here. And I figured out she was crying. And I said, well, Vicki, what's wrong? She said, well, if you're right, my grandma's not in heaven. But if I think my grandma's in heaven, she'll be in heaven. I said, uh, no, Vicki, the problem is your grandma is where your grandma is. There's one person we got to deal with, and that's you, and I'm trying to help you do that. See, but she couldn't get over that hump see, about grandma. And it happens a lot. It happens a lot. When people run the calculation, say, wait a minute. I was having a study in, in um, Clyde Park. And uh, just up the road from Clyde Park is Wilson. And there's this big, huge arena up there where they do uh, national level quarter horse rating associating meetings. <laughs> and the big judge had flown in from uh, Wichita Falls to Texas to, to do the judging. Well, he was a friend of the guys I was studying with and claimed to be a Christian, you know. And so him and his wife, they had their Bibles all marked up, yellow, highlighted and everything. And sat down so I started going through the rabbit shooters of course we hit the idea that you know the the new covenant didn't take effect until Jesus died and we talked about how you know the guy let down through the roof uh, you know he was forgiven but Jesus was still alive and we got to the thief on the cross and you know he was forgiven but Jesus was still alive and I said so well, we're going to have to turn to Acts chapter 2 to figure out what happens after the new covenant takes effect. So we get to Acts 2.38. So they're looking at that. And he, the big judge, he turns to his wife and he said, my dad was never baptized for any reason, was he? And she said, no. That study ended right there. I mean, it continued on for another 10 minutes, but that study ended right there. They're not going there. See, it happens all the time. Because the fact that, see, you're going to know the truth. The truth is going to make you free. Until you're free, you're still in bondage. That this, it takes a genius to figure that out. But uh, this, is, this, is, this is the Gentile world. These are the people apart from Christ. Strangers to the covenants of promise. Separated from God. Ignorant. Lost. Well, they're really good people. Well, who defines good? Remember the time the rich young ruler comes up to Jesus and he said, Hey, uh, good teacher. He said, uh, What good thing could I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus fires back. He said, Why are you calling me good? There's only one good. You know, he's looking to see if there's any light. No, no flicker. Because he's saying, well, are you calling me good because you recognize who I am? No, it was a schmooze job. That's what it was. Okay. See, but who is good? There is none good, not even one. All have turned aside. Together they become useless. There's none righteous. There's not even one. That's a divine analysis of the human race. By their own choice. They weren't born that way. They chose that. 
See, and that's that's their condition. And so you don't you don't get to say, well, I think there's probably some good people out there that are going to go to heaven. There aren't any. Just just get that off the table right to start with. I was kind of reminded. I I have a study with the real estate agent that sold Katie in our our house, and uh, he's from Manhattan originally. Well, there's a an um, old kind of insurance agent type of guy, uh, their accountant in, in uh, Manhattan, and he took the business over from from his dad. So that family had been working the lower end of the Gallatin Valley for a long time. So I had taught his wife and immersed her before they, they got married, and so then I continued to study with him. He said, man, I'm not getting this. So one night he said, you know, he said my, my brother-in-law, uh, he's connected with Trinity College in Chicago, whatever that is, and he'll be here next week. And he said, I'd like you guys to kind of go back and forth in my presence here so I can sort some of this stuff out. And, of course, I say, yeah, well, I, I think I can do that. And uh, so this guy comes in, and I do the rabbit shoot. Rabbit shooters works every time. It just, you know, it just squeezes. I, so I rabbit shot him, got him down. I said, well, well, there's nothing I can say about this. And the insurance guy, he says, well, he said, I can see that's what it says. He said, but, you know, I've known a lot of good people here. A lot of them have, have already died. And he said, I'm having a hard time believing that God's going to keep these good people out of heaven just because they aren't baptized. Well, who said they're good people? Who said they're good people? If I say they're good people, then I am placing myself in the position of being judge. I am judging where I'm not supposed to be judging, right? Amazing how they get that one twisted backwards, isn't it? Let's go to John 3. John chapter 3. This is John 3.16 through 21 are generally in red letters, but I don't, I don't think it is red letters. I mean, I, you know, I can't prove it, but I think the red letters end at verse 15, and then John 3.16 on is John's commentary. Okay, You just might look at that sometime. Um, but anyhow, when we get down here to uh, uh, verse uh, 19, it says, This is the judgment that the light has come into the world, and men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. Everyone who does not come to the light on the light's terms, deeds are evil. Don't come to the light because you're trying to hide. The other side of that, he who practices the truth comes to light. You have the absolute guarantee that anywhere on this planet there's a person who is a truth seeker. God's going to get them. They're going to be able to come to the light. And he's going to use some of us to get there. Yep. So any, any closing thoughts or anything anybody wants to toss in here tonight? Right, Nick? There's one of two eternities, and you're thinking about that person who is in the not so good eternity. Do you think they would be rooting for you to believe that they were saved, or that they were saved, or that you were saved, right? Yeah, if they could see. Yeah. Do you think they'd be all? I sure hope you pick my path. Yep. Yeah. You know, they would. They wouldn't. Yep. Right. They would be praying. You know. So. You know. Yeah, that's that. That's kind of an interesting point related to that. You know, a lot of times I have the opportunity to do a memorial service or a funeral for somebody that wasn't a Christian. Sometimes people think they were Christians, but if you know the the way of truth, they weren't. Okay. Which are very interesting messages to preach. Okay. And uh, so. <clears throat> 
you know, one of the things that I can do is I say, you know, if that person could talk to you now, here's what they'd say. And I know what they'd say because in Luke chapter 16, there's the rich guy who died. And he's in agony in that place. And he says, send somebody to my brother so they don't have to come to this place. And I said, so what they would say is you need to follow the scripture. You need to get it right. That's what they'd say. They, I said, they know more clearly now than they ever know what's right and how important it is. They would, they would say that. See, I got good scriptural grounds for doing that. See? Because, yeah. So why would you, why would you choose death if you, had, if you really had any comprehension at all? I mean, yeah. And they wouldn't say, follow me in death. No, wouldn't say that. No, no matter. Yeah, yeah it's a good point. Uh, any other comments? Well, I appreciate you guys. Kind of atten kind of attention tonight. Let's uh, fold it up in prayer. Holy and righteous Father in heaven, very excited to be here. And just thank you for everybody participating tonight. I earnestly pray, Father, you continue to open up doors for contacts and, and uh, contacts that are very interested in truth. We know that you can put us in touch with them. So pray that uh, we find them and they find us. We are very grateful to be participants as, as junior partners in, in your operation and thank you that uh, we can kind of do this together shoulder to shoulder and arm in arm. So we thank